Good morning and welcome to the TVERC Recorders Conference 2020. Uh, my name is Yolanda Vasquez and uh, I will be talking about the Local Wildlife Sites project in Berkshire and Oxfordshire. Um, I'm the Biodiversity Projects Officer for TVERC and currently also part-time Interim Projects Manager um, while we cover some staff shortages. Um, and although I'll be delivering this presentation, um, Caitlin Coombs and Julie Kerens will be online also to um, answer any questions specific to the local wildlife sites, um, as they are the ones who've done most of most of the surveys this year. So um, what I'm going to cover during this presentation is a little bit about what local wildlife sites are, just in case there are some new people to the conference that, that don't know this. So I'll um, try and uh, go over this relatively quickly um, and the highlights for 2020 and some of the changes we've experienced uh, due to COVID-19 and then a little bit about how you can get involved and, and the value of, of uh, involvement for, from volunteers. So what are local wildlife sites? Um, essentially local wildlife sites are <clears throat> land recognised as having high value to wildlife um, however, they're considered to be important at the county level. Uh, so they might not be as important uh, on the national level or having that recognition of having <clears throat> statutory designation. However, uh, they are essentially the, the best of the best at, at the county level. Um, and they, although they don't receive that statutory protection uh, that Tripler size and SACs do, they do have to receive uh, consideration and be taken into account when uh, local authorities um, or local planning authorities uh, look at uh, any planning applications that they receive. And they can also form very vital links uh, between those protected sites to create that connectivity network that is um, very important. Um, they can be on privately owned or publicly owned land and some, some sites are publicly accessible, but many of them tend to be privately owned um, and it tends to be only with, with permission from, from the landowner that we can go and access those sites. So a quick overview of the local wildlife sites projects, uh, because there are some small differences between um, the projects in Berkshire and, and Oxfordshire. Um, so essentially in Oxfordshire, the project is a collaboration between BeBout and TVERC. So BeBout take responsibility for all the um, management of, um, they keep the landowner database, all the information on landowners, um, and they contact the landowners and arrange permissions. Uh, and they also offer management advice, so they have a kind of more of a long established and continuing relationship with with landowners. However, in, in Berkshire, um, TVERC are responsible for the landowner liaison. Um, so we contact the landowners and keep a database on landowners in, in Berkshire. Um, however, we offer limited management advice and therefore the kind of the contact isn't as hands on um, as it as it could be. Um, due to kind of funding and, and the limited amount of, of time that, that we have to uh, get involved with landowners. Uh, for both projects, uh, TVERC carries out the surveys, we arrange the um, selection panels, and we maintain all the information, uh, both geospatial um, and uh, reports and, and that kind of thing, all the historical information on, on local wildlife sites. Um, once we've done the surveys, we write the reports and we provide, provide copies of these to both uh, landowners and the selection panel. So they base their, their decision on the reports that we write. <clears throat> and we also provide support for volunteer recorders carrying out any additional site surveys. So we focus mainly on doing habitat and botanical uh, species surveys. So any other type of, of, of surveys that we might um, want to carry out for local wildlife sites, whether that's invertebrates, uh, birds, mammals, that kind of thing, then, then we have um, some volunteer recorders that, that go out and help out with those and we try and support them as best we can. Uh, just a quick overview of the selection process. Um, so anyone can identify um, a site that they think might meet the local wildlife site criteria and then propose that um, 
And the way by doing this is you would contact TVERC. TVERC could then provide you with a proposed local wildlife site form that you would need to fill in and essentially do a kind of a preliminary assessment as to how uh, that site might meet the, the criteria. Um, this will then be looked at by um, ecologists, uh, both from TVERC and the local authority. And if we think that it, it has some potential to, to meet the criteria, then it will be added to the proposed site list and added to the GIS layer. Um, once it's on the list, then in due course, we will seek permission to survey the site. And if we are successful in getting that permission, then we will go and survey um, the site, write up a report, which will then be considered by the selection panel and assessed against the local wildlife site selection criteria. And ideally, that site will either be accepted or rejected as a local wildlife site. Occasionally, um, and we try and avoid this as much as possible, a site might be deferred if there's not enough evidence. So an example of this might be if the, the surveyor goes to the site um, and it's, for example, a lowland meadow um, that has been mown the previous day, then obviously that's not a fair assessment of the biodiversity of, of the site. Um, so we would have to go back and, and gather further evidence. And we aim to reassess the sites every 10 years. However, this is very much resource and permission dependent. So there are some sites that haven't been surveyed since the 1980s. Um, just a quick outline, really, of the sites, what local wildlife sites are uh, looking like in Oxfordshire. So um, there's approximately just under 400 um, local wildlife sites in Oxfordshire with quite a few proposed. And I believe there's more in the pipeline. Um, and they cover about 3% of, of the land area and about 40 sites are surveyed per year. Um, again, these are approximate numbers because essentially we work on the number of survey days. So if we survey a big site um, that takes a couple of days, then obviously there are going to be few, fewer sites surveyed that year. In Berkshire, there are just over 700, so a significant, um, significantly higher number of, of sites uh, with about 11 proposed and they cover a slightly larger percentage of the county area. And about 20 to 25 surveys, uh, sorry, sites are surveyed per year. So changes in 2020. Well, as we all know, 2020 has been a big year uh, for everybody. Um, but other than COVID, uh, Caitlin started in March. So Caitlin uh, started as maternity cover for Catherine Holmes, um, who covers the Berkshire area. Um, and after about three weeks after Port Caitlin started, COVID hit. Um, so we were all sent home to work from home and obviously no surveys were being carried out. Um, staff shortages due to personal responsibilities, um, particularly in the survey team. So Caitlin was left a little bit stranded working on her own with not, you know, the support that she should have had um, right at the beginning. Um, However, the rest of the team helped out in every way they could. Um, and we struggled, also struggled to get permissions for survey. So uh, obviously people had other things on their mind during those first few months other than answering our letters and emails to grant us permission. Uh, so we had to try and find uh, a way around that. And um, in Berkshire, uh, kind of Caitlin focused then on targeting sites owned by the local authorities or sites that were on open access land so that eventually if things opened up and we were allowed out again um, then we wouldn't have to worry too much about permissions and we could just get out there and start doing the surveys and then Syene guidance on a survey carrying out surveys in a in a COVID safe way started to bring hope and eventually the council changed its its policy, um, allowing for surveys um, about, I think, the end of end, end of April. Um, and surveys finally started at the start of May, following safety procedures, of course. So the kind of things that we had to do to, to keep COVID safe is travel in our own cars, so no car sharing um, or public transport, bring our own food and water, use hand sanitizer and gloves, particularly like when touching things like gates or, or eating our lunch, 
always maintain a two meter distance from colleagues if, if there was two of us or more of us going out on surveys um, and any other members of, of the public that we might encounter and always take our own equipment. So, you know, we weren't sharing clipboards or hand lenses and, and that kind of thing. Um, so essentially life kind of started to return to the new normal um, for the local wildlife site team uh, in May. Uh, however, of course, we kind of missed a couple of key months um, of surveying. Ideally, we like to get out surveying March to April, particularly uh, for the woodlands where that's the best time to to go and survey the woodlands where, you know, things are, it's the most kind of biodiverse time to, to see everything before it all becomes overgrown. So these are the kind of things that we have to bear in mind when we take some of the woodland sites to, to panel. So some of the Berkshire highlights for 2020. So uh, Caitlin was out on her own um, and she managed to get 19 sites surveyed, including two proposed. So that's pretty much the, the target. Um, so that's excellent work from Caitlin. Um, and she got out to some calcareous grasslands, ancient woodland, wet woodland, lowland meadow, lowland fen, river and canals, uh, and floodplain grazing marsh. So quite a range of habitats. Um, and she managed to also recruit uh, 11 volunteers to get out to about seven of those sites and, and collect some records, which is excellent considering that we've, we've notoriously struggled with getting volunteers <clears throat> in Berkshire to carry out other surveys. So she did this essentially by creating a job description and really getting uh, putting the information out there to local recording groups, um, using social media, uh, advertising in countryside jobs and publishing in things in our new newsletter. Um, and people went out there and they essentially recorded mostly uh, invertebrates, which is excellent because they're under recorded in our database um, and also some water vole surveys and some plants as well. So I think there were 22 people interested um, and 11 carried out surveys. The rest uh, were not sure really and weren't comfortable due to COVID, but they are interested for next year. So that's excellent that we've already got that interest there for um, the coming up, the survey, sorry, the, the um, uh, survey season coming up. Um, and hopefully things will be again more opened up um, next year. So one of the uh, sites that uh, Caitlin highlighted for uh, Berkshire, uh, particularly West Berkshire, is um, Luff Down, which is just over 11 hectares. Um, and it's a rich calcareous grassland um, on a steep bank with flanked by hedgerows and has some scattered scrub and lowland mixed deciduous woodland. Um, I believe that a student uh, joined Caitlin um, to kind of learn a little bit about the project and gain some hands-on experience on habitat surveying. So that's, that's really good as well. And some species that were recorded there, typical of calcareous grassland, um, included ladies' bed straw, agrimony, common century, wild basil, greater knapweed, harebell, small scabious, and wild marjoram, and also autumn gentian, eyebright, pale toad flax, yellow wort, and pyramidal orchid. And it looks like some badger sets uh, were seen there, as, and with some active ones with hairs on, around the entrance. Another highlight in Berkshire was Carpenter's Wood uh, in Windsor and Maidenhead area. Uh, that's a large site with public access at just over 22 hectares um, and it included lowland mixed deciduous woodland and lowland beach and new woodland and some calcareous grassland. Um, and I believe some of the ancient woodland uh, indicator highlights were woodruff, wood anemone, pendulous sedge, wood spurge, yellow archangel, wood millet, uh, wood millet senecal and black briny. Uh, and one of the other sites uh, that were highlighted by Caitlin was the River Kennet and Kennet and Avon Canal um, in the Reading stretch. So this is quite a long stretch of 9.48 uh, hectares um, and it is essentially eutrophic running water and with lush bankside and emergent vegetation. Um, I think Caitlin felt that this was a good example of how public access and biodiversity conservation can work together. 
Um, I know that there's, uh, I think, Action for the River Kennet work on lots of stretches of the of the River Kennet and do really good work. Um, I'm not sure if they're involved in 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 the Reading area. I'm sure Caitlin can kind of <laughs> enlighten us to to whether that's that's the group that is um, is carrying out a lot of of nice work there. Um, there was good faunal bi biodiversity within a range of uh, dragonflies, hymenoptera, um, including some which haven't been recorded yet in this part of the county, and some signs of water voles. Um, and now to the highlights in Oxfordshire for 2020. So 26 sites were surveyed um, in Oxfordshire. Uh, it says two surveyors, but essentially that was mostly Julie. Um, I got involved uh, on a couple of sites with her, um, plus a couple that I did by myself, but the rest was all Julie, so I can only take a very small portion of the credit there. Um, and there was a mix of woodlands, so there was wet woodlands, lowland mixed deciduous woodland, um, calcareous grassland lakes, ponds, wetlands and reed beds. Um, I, for one, certainly felt that there was a lot of walking around large water bodies this year. I don't know if Julie felt the same, but that, that's the feel that I got for Oxfordshire this year. And one of those large water bodies was uh, Farmore Reservoir, which is one of the largest uh, local wildlife sites in Oxfordshire at 190 hectares. So that took us two days of a post-lockdown brain climbing over fences and trawling over through wetlands um, to survey. It's a site that's essentially mostly important for birds um, and that's how it will probably be assessed um, against the criteria. However, there was nice habitat there with um, wetland and species rich meadow areas. Um, species seen were in uh, included um, tufted fetch, common reed, bulrush, greater and lesser pond sedge, common club rush, marsh woundwort, meadowsweet, grape burnet, water mint, purple loose strife, skullcap, lesser spearwort, common spike rush and brookweed. Another site with large uh, water bodies uh, that we had to walk around was Bradley Gravel Pits. Um, so this is uh, essentially their former gravel workings that are located in the floodplain of the, the River Thames. And some of those pits have been infilled whilst others have been retained as, as water bodies. So it's kind of created a complex of like water bodies, woodland and species rich grassland. So I think the most one of the most species rich areas was to the west of the site at Barton Fields. Um, where we recorded uh, pyramidal orchids, wild carrot, ladies' bed straw, meadows, cr meadow cranes bill, common bird's foot trefoil, oxide daisy, wild marjoram, cowslip, yellow rattle, betony, and small amounts of field scabious and common rest harrow. Um, but one of the big highlights uh, of the site was uh, marsh helleborine recorded around one of the, the water bodies, um, which unfortunately I didn't get to see, <laughs> but Julie did. So this is one bit where we, we split off and did different bits and, and Julie got the, uh, the lucky bit of seeing marsh helleborine. So I just get to see a photo like everybody else. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, another highlight from Oxfordshire was a, a site near Hook Norton. So this is a species rich uh, grassland um, on steep valley banks um, and it's formed by the upper reaches of, of the river Swear. Um, it had both calcareous and acidic influences and the species recorded there included devil's bit scabious, betony, salad burnet, tormental, meadow vetchling, ladies bed straw, drop work, black knapweed and harebell. And I believe that the highlight was lousewort, which had been previously recorded on there, but maybe not seen for a while, um, I think. But uh, yeah, ask ask Julie if you want to know more about the lousewort. Um, and yeah, eventually, how, how can you get involved? Well, as I said before, identifying sites, anyone can identify and propose a site if you think it might meet the criteria. So do let us know if, if there's anything out there um, that you think we're not aware of. And as we can see, the survey support uh, this year from volunteers has been excellent in Berkshire. Um, and obviously, like, we, we want that from, from both counties. I know that usually in, in Oxfordshire, there is quite a lot of volunteer support as well. Um, so uh, in, in Berkshire this year, there was at least uh, 700 additional species records um, entered. And that's really exciting. Some of them uh, being really good with evidence of waterfalls along the River Kennet. Uh, and invertebrate sightings, which which suggest specific species may be expanding their ranges. 
um, that includes high numbers of white-legged uh, damselflies and a sighting of Adrena florea, uh, which is a red data book rare mining bee. And these are in areas of Berkshire that these species had not been previously recorded, uh, which is in the, the River Kennet area. So thank you very much to Nick Percival and Ivan Wright, respectively, for, for those two records. OK, thank you very much for listening. And um, if you'd like to contact us uh, regarding uh, any of the specific areas of Berkshire, Oxfordshire or in general, then these are our contact details. Um, thanks again.